In chapter 13, that's not right, <laughs> week 13, <laughs> we're going to talk about alternative platforms. Uh, we're, what we are talking about is uh, game, um, uh, video games. Um, as you can see, this is a virtual reality game that she's playing. Um, a little disappointed in the textbook that I, that I chose for this class, uh, or this this lecture. Um, next week I have I have other textbooks coming in. Next week, so the uh, the next week's lecture should be better. Uh, I've got I've got a textbook that talks about uh, using games as uh, therapy. So that'll be the last week. Next next week we'll talk about uh, vi violent uh, video games and uh, their effects on people. Hopefully we will anyway. If that textbook ever comes in, I said <laughs> I made the mistake. For some reason, my uh, Amazon account uh, uh, defaults to Marius's house. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. I, I sent him a book once upon a time, and now they think I want to send all my books to, to Marius's house. But that's silly. Anyway, um, hopefully that book will get here sometime next week, and and I can. Uh, give you better information or different information anyway. So let's go ahead and get started. Not a very long lect lecture today. Um, like I said, I was a little disappointed with this textbook. So let's go ahead and get started. The textbook was written by uh, uh, people that uh, support the uh, the gaming industry. So it made you know, all, all of the research that says, well, this research says this, but this research says that. Uh, this is a situation we were in with uh, t the tobacco companies. Now, you guys don't remember a time when tobacco companies were uh, uh, suing people for saying negative things about tobacco. But uh, I was alive when all that was taking place. And I was alive when they're the... Um, the medical community brought suit against the tobacco companies for lying to them for years or for decades for for a hundred over a hundred years. So I have a feeling it's the same way with uh, with video games. Um, there were two movies, two movies, two movies about this. Uh, one had to do with uh, um, did video games taking over the world, kind of. Uh, Next Player One or something like that. And the other one had to do with uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds was a was a uh, f character in a in a video game, and he took over his own his own self really fascinating movies. Anyway, uh, we'll get into that next week. Maybe. <clears throat> In the beginning there was, while there is much debate about the, the first video game, mostly over what criteria to use to constitute a video game, the first endeavor that looked like a video game was called Tennis for Two by one of the scientists working on the Manhattan Project, a guy by the name of Willie Higginbotham. Willie came up with a um, with a game uh, that looked like Pong. Um, I, if you've ever seen Pong, and, and potentially you haven't, uh, but uh, of course I was around when Pong was invented. Um, he, uh, the Manhattan Project had to do with the development of the atomic bomb. So this is way back in the 40s, in the early 40s. Um, and but he didn't do anything with it. He didn't uh, uh, he didn't commercialize it. They never manufactured it. It was just something uh, that was there. And uh, the only people, of course, that could play it were people with the right equipment. And there were hardly any people with the right equipment. So this is this information. This uh, this video game tennis for two is kind of uh, just information for technological historians. And gaming geeks, so if they say, what's the first uh, video game, you know, if, if you're in the new, you know, it was Tennis for Two by, developed by Willie Higginbotham. 
the first video game to find a large audience and to be able uh, to be available beyond a single exhibition was Space War. It was initially developed by the three students of at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stephen R. Slug Russell, uh, J. Martin Greats, and uh, Wine Wittenden. Uh, Slug Russell is still around, by the way. That's, he's kind of an interesting guy. In 1962, Space War allowed two players to control dueling spaceships and attempt to shoot each other with torpedoes while orbiting a black hole. Space War played using a cathode ray tube display and custom-built uh, controllers on the Digital Equipment Corporation's PDP-1 computer also featured a score display. This and other competition-oriented uh, features ensured that Space War was a hit. Within a year of its 1962 demonstration at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's annual Science Open House in May uh, 1962, copies and variations of the Space War program began to emerge at research laboratories across the United States, and the game was being played not only on PDP-1 computers, but on other computers that used a cathode ray tube display as well. And this is what it looked like, and this is that slug right there. And this, this is the cathode ray that they're talking about. So it was kind of like the early television sets. And these are the two guys. They can't get anywhere close to each other. All they could do is shoot at each other with torpedoes. You can see their, the equipment they were using to do this. <clears throat> and you can see that they had ties and suits on. <laughs> Well, the actual Space War game, as originally programmed, could not be commercialized because it was played on expensive research computers that were usually inaccessible to the public. The first coin-operated arcade games were both adaptations of, pay of Space War. Galaxy, a one-of-a-kind arcade unit that debuted on the Stanford campus, uh, university campus in Palo Alto, California, in 1971, and was the first coin-operated video game, The Computer uh, Space, a mass-produced coin-operated arcade game released later the same year throughout the United States. And this is what the uh, the uh, galaxy looked like. This is, these are the ones that were on the uh, uh, Stanford campus. And I'll show you what the uh, uh, computer space looks like in just a second. But this is the galaxy game. Okay, so this is 1971. That's the year I graduated from college. And that's the year I joined the military. This is what computer space looked like. And as you can see, there were buttons and whatnot. Therefore, whatever early devices credited as the first video game, there's no debating that Space War accomplished two milestones important to the scalability of the video game as a mass medium. It was the first uh, video game to be played on more than one machine, and the first video game to be adapted for commercialization. Actually, Galaxy was played on more than one machine, but there were only two of them, so... I guess, but this was mass produced. The uh, computer space was mass produced. 1972 saw the release of the first commercial home video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, which featured sport and shooting games among its game titles. Uh, the Odyssey console used light signals combined with overlays placed on the user's television screens to simulate graphics and featured predominantly sports and action games, though some games featured other simulations such as roulette. The popular Atari video computer system, the v, uh, VCS, later renamed the Atari 2600, uh, as later console versions were developed, was released with a game titled Combat that featured 27 combat games such as tank and biplane duels. And this, of course, is the uh, Atari 2600. Uh, my kids had one of these. They didn't play them very often, but they still had one. Through so much technological advancement over decades, though, the video game industry's uh, most popular titles remain heavily fixed in the themes of simulating sport and combat that inspired the first uh, video game prototypes. The top 10 best-selling video games in the United States in 2013 included two games from the perennially 
popular military-themed Call of Duty franchise, Call of Duty Ghosts, and Call of Duty Black Ops 2, as well as Battlefield 4, another entry from a popular military-themed series. Two more video games, uh, chart-topping Grand Theft Auto V and Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag included combat simulation as a heavy component of their themes. Madden NFL 25 and NBA 2K14 2014, represented uh, annual releases from sports franchises, the annual entry from the popular FIFA video game series, a notable omission from the United States list, given its popularity in, such, in much of the rest of the world, with Just Dance 2014 arguably something of a sporting simulation as well, where you have to dance, I guess. Of the top 10 sellers in the United States, then only the console media... Uh, edition of Minecraft and Disney Infinity were uh, not primarily action simulations of war, combat, or sport. In 1978, two British computer science um, uh, students at the University of Essex named Roy Trubshaw and Richard Bartle uh, finished the first functioning version of a very different kind of game that they would continue to refine and develop through two more versions through 1980. While even the term video game indicates the importance of rich graphical representations to most examples of the medium, uh, Trubshaw and Bartle's game had no graphics at all. Uh, their game, uh, MUD, uh, Multi-User Dungeon, instead relied on interactive text commands and automatically generated text feedback for all players' interactions with the game program, as well as between players using the game at the same time. To play MUD, users connected to the game online by creating and logging into character accounts with names and statistics describing attributes such as stamina. Using these character characters, which existed in the game uh, solely as uh, text descriptions, like all the game's other elements, Players then navigated a vast game environment by typing commands to travel from location to location, interact with the objects and features of the environment, talk to other players, and fight with both uh, other players and computer-controlled characters. The game's program responded to the commands with text feedback such as descriptions of places, characters, and objects, as well as feedback des describing the results of, of attempts to carry out actions such as picking up an object, or attacking a foe. Aside from indulging in these game dynamics, players could also have conversations with each other via text, either privately or in view of other players. An inspiration for Zork and Colossal Cave Adventure was the paper and pencil dice-based tabletop role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons in 1974. Created as a partial adaptation of existing strategy war games, but with players controlling individual characters instead of military units, Dungeons & Dragons was the first commercial role-playing game and has remained a dominant fixture in the genre since. The popularity of Dungeons & Dragons themes and mechanics uh, in mud games was uh, perhaps predictable considering that Dungeons & Dragons players were using online networks as a rudimentary communication tool to facilitate playing their tabletop games across distance even before MUD was created. Dungeons & Dragons is, still exists. Um, the uh, Clinton School District just hired a Dungeons & Dra Dragons coordinator for their school. Uh, so they are looking to... Uh, to start a Dungeons and Dragons club at Clinton High School. Well, Clinton schools, I guess, junior high kids can play as well. A key source of thematic inspiration for Dungeons and Dragons was the famed work of J.R.R. Tolkien, a British professor of Oxford University who produced influential scholarship on topics such as the Old English epic poem Beowulf and who achieved much uh, popular fame by pinning best-selling fantasy novels such as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And, of course, The Lord of the Rings is a trilogy, Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. 
Uh, Tolkien's work, a popular culture staple by the 1970s, had a heavy imprint on the themes of Dungeons and Dragons, as is best evidenced by the inclusion of several fantastic creature species, including Tolkien's iconic hobbits, from Tolkien's stories uh, in the original version of the game. Uh, however, he sued to have uh, his characters taken out uh, of Dungeons and Dragons, and he won his lawsuit. And so they had to take uh, take out the uh, <clears throat> the original or the the hobbits and the, the orcs and and whatnot. Habitat released online in nineteen. Now you got to remember that uh, the internet didn't really start uh, as we know it until nineteen ninety three. So all of this was taking place um, in a, um, a computer world where communication was not that easy. You had to um, dial into people's computers. That's the way you did it, with modems. Uh, so, of course, at the time, I was working in, in medicine at the time. And uh, if I was working in a hospital and we needed uh, uh, results from another hospital's laboratory, we would have to dial into their computer. We'd have to dial into their modem. Um, and you'd have to know their telephone number in order to, to get that kind of information. That's what was going on in 1986. Habitat, released online in 1986, allowed players to interact with each other and the environment via text uh, commands and also represented characters, objects, and settings with simple graphics. Uh, of course, now with the World Wide Web, uh, with the internet as we know it today, uh, you don't need to. You don't need a modem. You don't need to dial into people's computers. It happens automatically uh, with uh, with your www dot, you know, http uh, colon slash slash www dot www dot whatever 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 their address is. It's it's like a big telephone system. Whereas before you had needed to have a modem so that you could actually you would actually have to dial them. Now the problem was back then, of course, if you're dialing into somebody's telephone, then you're actually using the telephone system, and it's it's all long distance. It potentially can be long distance, and for this reason, a lot of kids got in trouble with their parents because they were not thinking or they were. Uh, not anticipating how much the long distance charges would be. Uh, so you could always tell where somebody had gone because they the telephone number would be on your telephone bill. Uh, and of course they would it would be long distance charges. So it's not like I could uh, you know dial into uh, uh, California from Iowa um, and stay online for for 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, it would be just like a long distance telephone call back this is back back then of course now that we have the world wide web things have changed habitat released uh, online in 1986 allowed players to interact with each other and the environment via text commands and also represented characters objects and settings with simple graphics rather than a fantastic uh, setting the habitat game environment included more mundane elements such as apartments and bank machine bank machines the graphics of Habitat were mostly static, and the gameplay and interaction between users was mostly driven by text commands and text uh, chat. The other thing that you need to know, uh, so we're, let's talk about bank machines. Uh, the ATMs that we have today. The ATMs are, are of course, connected to the Internet. Um, and in the old days, if you wanted, I mean, the, the only bank machines... That, that you had, you had to go to the bank to get money. Uh, you couldn't uh, just go to an ATM and, and get money because there was no connection. You would have to have a modem dial into that bank to find out if you actually had those funds. So the bank machines, the ATMs, as it were, didn't exist uh, back in 1986. The graphics of Habitat were mostly static and the gameplay and interaction between users was mostly driven by text commands and text chat. 
1991, The Neverwinter Nights brought more dynamic graphics that portrayed movement each time a player moved the character avatar with the keyboard arrow key. The game was successful with a peak subscriber total of more than 100,000 by 1997, and its graphical advancements uh, have earned it retrospective recognition as the first graphical version of the massive multiplayer online role-playing game genre, Never, Never Winter Nights, 1991. Given the catch-all nature of the term video game, clear articulations of the medium's economic impact and audience are elusive, given that the diversity in the range of technologies, forms, and themes described as video games is mirrored by diversity in their range of business models and users. Some current estimates of the total revenue of the worldwide video game market are in the neighborhood of 81 $0.5 billion uh, to, to $93 billion uh, US, U.S. dollars, with uh, continued growth predicted in the coming years. And I apologize, I should have taken that 70 out. Uh, the first video game subjected to moral panic was the 1976 driving simulator Death Race, an arcade uh, machine in which players sitting at the controls of a physical steering wheel and gas pedal, earn points for using their on-screen car as a weapon to run over gremlins. And this is what it looked like, Death Race. There's the gas pedal right there, and there are the wheels. The game sparked controversy for essentially encouraging players to use their cars in an aggressive manner, awarding them points for committing ve vehicular homicide rem reminiscent of the 1975 film Death Race, Death, Death Race 2000, which starred Sylvester Stallone, by the way, <laughs> and David Carradine. Researchers proclaim that while television violence is passive, in Death Race, the player takes the first step to creating violence. The player is no longer just a spectator, he's an actor in the process. <laughs> The pr most prominent il il illustration of the limits of what uh, the public would be willing to accept in a violent video game can be found in the 1992 release of the arcade uh, fighter Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat broke an implicit taboo about what was okay to put in a video game, such as the game's use of motion capture technology to display realistic human body movement, the intense focus on blood and gore uh, during in-game fights, and the not-so-secret fatality special moves where players could brutally kill each other through a series of beatings, beheadings, and disembowelments based on the talent, uh, talents of the gamer as well as their in-game character. Although the game's reputation in arcades had drawn some criticism from activist groups, it was the game's home release on September 20, 1993, or Mortal, Mortal Monday as labeled in a $10 million advertising campaign by Mortal by producer Acclaim uh, at the time of the largest advertising campaign ever for a video game that was most concerning for a critical public. <clears throat> Prior to release, Nintendo censored out, censored out the blood and violence and altered the fatality moves to make them less graphic in their Super Nintendo version of the game. While not editing the original game code except to make it compatible with their system, uh, Sega uh, chose instead to label the game packaging with an MA-13 as not appropriate for children under the age of 13. However, in the face of intensifying congressional scrutiny to answer questions about whether or not games were training killers and encouraging graphic violence, the two companies instead chose to debate each other's relative moral stance. And this is Mortal Kombat, as you can see. It has an MA-13. There you go, Sega. Mortal Kombat. Complicating these debates was a complete lack of any scientific data on the potential impact of video games on aggression, leaving all sides of the argument with little more than empty rhetoric on which to base their claims. In the face of mounting public, governmental, and, and industry pressure to, to address the moral panic caused by Mortal Kombat, 
1994 saw the creation of the Entertainment Software Rating Boards, an independent organization funded by the gaming industry and designed to empower consumers, especially parents, with guidance that allows them to make informed decisions about the age appropriateness and suitability of video games. Mortal Kombat was the first game ever assigned ESRB's M rating for mature audiences only. And I can remember when all this was taking place, my, my son uh, had, a, uh, had a Sega, I think, or maybe it was a Nintendo. Anyway, he showed me, he showed me uh, this, this guy cutting this guy's head off. And I said, you know, that looks real. And he says, well, do you, how do you know? And I said, well, you know, I've seen that for real. And it's, it's not a whole lot of fun. That's not something that most people want to see. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I remember when all this was taking place. An established rating system did little to quell moral panics uh, related to uh, video game uh, violence and a series of high-profile school shootings in the United States reignited concerns that video games served as interactive murder simulations. <clears throat> Investigations into the cause of the tragic incidents in Paducah, Kentucky on December 1st, 1997 and Columbine, Colorado, April 20th, 1999 by politicians implicated video games as a root cause. On the surface, linking violent video games to school shootings was a simple matter of observational deduction given the increased popularity of the first-person shooting game in the 1990s. Games such as Wolfstein 3D, 1992, and Doom in 1993 ushered in a genre of video games in which the player was effectively placed in the shoes of the main protagonist a Nazi prisoner in the former, and a space marine in the latter. Armed with high-powered weapons and challenged with navigating a series of mazes and puzzles while being attacked on all sides by enemy soldiers and demons. As games gained in popularity, the content of games became increasingly scandalous, such as the most commercially and critically successful games in the medium's history with Grand Theft Auto. <clears throat> the 2001 release of Grand Theft Auto 3 popularized the sandbox genre of video games in which the player has the ability to navigate the environment as if it were real. In this game, uh, players adopt the role of a criminal involved in any number of organized crime activities, from car theft to drug running, prostitution, and murder. The content is decidedly dark, from the theft of vehicles to get from one mission to the next to the murder of rival crime bosses, police officers, and innocent bystanders who might interfere with the player's objectives. There were widespread fears that gamers would be a generation of fatties who never left the house, stereotyping the social unattractiveness and awkwardness of gamers. <clears throat> a case in point, James Dallas Egbert III, a Michigan State University student, went missing in August of 1979. Early fears about Egbert's disappearance centered around his fascination with the role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. Many early media reports suggested that he had taken refuge in steam tunnels below the school to reenact scenarios from the game. It was later discovered that Egbert suffered from severe depression and had entered the steam tunnels in an attempt to commit suicide in seclusion. Following the Egbert story, scores of panics um, regarding D&D &D players as malcontents, incapable of discerning fantasy and reality, led to similar allegations in the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, you may wonder what happened to James Dallas Egbert. Uh, James Dallas Egbert did commit suicide, but not in the steam tunnels under Michigan State. Really fascinating story. The kid was a genius. Uh, he entered Michigan State at the age of 16, graduated from high school at 15, uh, entered Michigan State at 16. Uh, he felt lonely. He felt isolated uh, because everybody else around him were the three and four years older. Um, he started playing D&D &D and uh, became depressed, of course, not because he was playing D&D, playing &D, but because he was lonely and because uh, he was 
he, he found out that he was gay. Okay, <clears throat> so he decides that he's going to commit, commit suicide, so he disappears. Uh, oddly enough, he didn't commit suicide in, at, in uh, East Lansing. Uh, strangely enough, he got on a bus and uh, went down to Texas and started working at uh, some place in Texas. Um, eventually, he was he was uh, hunted down by uh, by a private detective hired by his family, and uh, at that point, he was uh, awarded to his uh, to his uncle, and eventually, he committed suicide. By a gunshot wound in the head. Now he, um, in 1979, he was 16 years old, but he didn't commit suicide until he was 19 years old, and this was three years later down in Texas. So you know all of this stuff about the D&D &D and and this causing his problems didn't have anything to do with with him committing suicide. Uh, as a matter of fact, it probably kept him alive longer. Uh, since it gave him something to do, and it gave him a reality other than his loneliness at, uh, at Michigan State. Uh, anyway, that's that's my diagnosis of what happened. I I know the 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 actual uh, time of his death and and how he killed himself didn't have anything to do with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, <clears throat> but it did have to do with uh, with him dying. Now, the strange thing is this isn't in, in the book that I was looking at, the textbook. I had to look this up uh, on the Internet, so I don't know why they didn't say how he died or when he died. But he didn't die in the steam tunnels underneath uh, uh, underneath Michigan State. Now, the interesting thing is that there were a lot of uh, college campuses that had, had extensive steam tunnels. That were how they, and That's how they, they uh, heated the uh, buildings on campus, you know, Purdue and, and um, there's a couple back east. Uh, anyway, so these became famous and, and people started, uh, after the story came out, people started using them for their Dungeons and Dragons games. Nobody ever died. Nobody ever committed suicide. It's, that's not the kind of deal. But they made a couple movies about it, which was kind of fun back in uh, the 1980s. Uh, with the advance of newer interactive technologies, the popularity of video games, especially among children, has reignited debates as to the role that mediated fantasies of death and destruction uh, play in the shaping of future generations. The current empirical record is by no means invalid, but rather in need of, of further refinement of research designed to better describe, explain, predict, and eventually control the results of the interaction between mediated content and human interactions with that content. The problem, the the, the authors of, of this chapter uh, have a problem with uh, research about video games and aggression, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. <clears throat> The problem is they're discounting all the research, which really bothers me a, a little bit. You know, they're looking at this and saying, oh, not, uh, there's nothing here. Well, there is something there, and obviously there's something there. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about next week. But let's go ahead and let these guys talk themselves out. Uh, doing, so re doing so requires us to better understand uh, our research heritage to seek uh, areas of replication and extension. The legacy of fear of media effects uh, is just that, a fear rooted in science, but all too often in the moral panics of well-meaning uh, researchers less committed to understanding a phenomenon and more committed to stopping it before it is fully understood. And of course, you know, if we let, sometimes if we let these things play out, now we got a problem. It's like, uh, uh, it's like COVID. Uh, when we first recognized it, uh, this is that. This is the game that Trump was playing. He was saying, "We don't know what it looks like. We really don't know what it looks like." And he was right. We didn't know what it looked like, but it looked bad, and we needed to stop it right then. Now, of course, this is the same kind of a situation. Uh, this looks bad. So instead of instead of stopping it where where it is, so we can see what it uh, what it might potentially do. Um, According to this guy, we should just let it roll. We should just let it go and then figure out later on uh, whether it was good or bad. That's what happened with COVID. We didn't, uh, we didn't do enough. 
and uh, and well over a million people have died of COVID. Uh, and this may be the same situation. This this whole uh, violence thing. If video games are causing people, even a small percentage of people, to be violent, maybe there is there is a problem that we need to deal with. And that's my point. Children and teens uh, seem to use video games to meet a wide range of emotional and developmental needs. For example, managing feelings. A survey of 1,254 middle schoolers in two states found that many children use video games for emotional regulation as an antidote to boredom and loneliness to relax and to vent angry feelings. This response from focus groups with 13-year-old boys was typical. If I had a bad day at school, I'll play a violent video game, and it just relieves all my stress. <sighs> now, as, as a psychologist, I would say, well, okay, but... Are, are we going to be playing video games all the rest of our lives in order to relieve our stress? Don't we need to learn ways to do this without, without uh, mass murder? Uh, trying on new identities, uh, many, vi many video games, especially online multiplayer games, allow players to safely experiment with new roles and identities. It's perfectly acceptable to play as a character of another age, gender, body shape, or species, players can test how it feels to not only look different, but to take on a different personality or a new role on a team and see how others react when they do. Uh, I was surprised. I was watching my grandson play uh, Fortnite the other day, and he was a female character with a short skirt on, and I was thinking, geez, is that okay? Is this something we're going to see in the future? Um, and and the answer is I don't know. He, you know, it's possible that he's gay. It's possible, I guess. But uh, taking on a female character uh, probably does. That's not what that means. Uh, what it means is well, I don't know what it means. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, does he like watching? You know, he's ten years old. Uh, he's starting to go through puberty. You can smell it in his sweat, and he's starting to get pimples. Uh, so, you know, is he starting to notice women uh, as different from him? Or, you know, does he want to be transgender, or does he want, is he gay? You know, all of these questions come up, and, and I agree that uh, it, it allows uh, people to, uh, uh, to try on other identities. Leadership and teamwork. Researchers have surveyed tens of thousands of people who play uh, MMOGs, massively multiplayer online games, such as uh, EverQuest and World of Warcraft, about their motivations for and experiences with gaming. Online uh, play in mixed age teams, where no one knows how old or young you are, offers unique opportunities for teens and young adults to observe, learn, and practice leading groups towards shared goals. Online leadership experience has been linked to managing others in offline settings such as voluntary organizations. Several studies suggest that team video game play encourages real-life helpful behavior. A study of British undergraduate students found that frequent players of computer games were more likely to cooperate for a win-win outcome with other players in prisoners' dilemma experiments. And, of course, that is really kind of interesting. And this isn't a bad idea. We're going to talk about uh, therapy. Um, next, next week I'm planning on talking about video games and violence. And the last, is, uh, the, the, the last lecture is going to be on uh, uh, video games and therapy. Uh, and the reality is that uh, uh, the military trains people using video games. Uh, they, they train them to be leaders. And this is, is something that, that uh, of course, uh, you can learn from, learn by doing. Uh, so this is potentially something that is, is very worthwhile. Competition and initiative in response to a series of questions about why they play video games. More than four in five middle school boys and almost two-thirds of girls agreed with the statement 
I like to compete with others and win. The challenge and excitement of testing strategies against opponents may promote initiative and healthy youth development. However, there is an ongoing vigorous debate about whether aggressive competition in games with violent content might undermine empathy or promote harmful behaviors. Curiosity, self-expression, and testing limits. Uh, video games allow children to escape real-world limitations and let their creativity soar. Boys in Focus uh, groups noted that over-the-top gory games are fun because I just love the fact that I know I can't. Ha it can't happen. In real world, there's limitation to what you can do. Uh, games that allow modding, from customizing characters to designing buildings, maps, and more, let players express themselves in ways that would be costly and difficult in real life and sometimes to share those mods with others. Players can also test theories of approaches, fail, and try again without real consequences. They can live, uh, they can die and come back and try it again. This is a giraffe driving a motorcycle, though he doesn't have his legs on the, the handlebars. Anyway. Practice setting goals and coping with frustration. In 1970s, Walter Mischel uh, began a series of experiments with preschoolers on delay of gratification. They were given the choice to eat marshmallows now or wait, usually 15 minutes, until the experimenter came back from an errand and get two marshmallows. Uh, this turned out to be a wonderful way to measure frustration tolerance and the ability to wait for a payoff. In longitudinal studies, researchers found that those children who learned ways to distract themselves and earn the second marshmallow had a wide range of advantages over their marshmallow gobbling peers. They proved better at planning and thinking ahead. They were more verbally fluent, resourceful, and attentive. They were less rattled under stress and were more socially outgoing. These gains persisted into adolescence. Seconds of marshmallow resistance time even statistically predicted higher SAT scores. Children with attention deficit uh, disorder, uh, both with and without hyperactivity, often struggle to stay focused and pay attention and are easily distracted, except when it comes to video games. Parents and teachers comment that children with attention problems seem to have no problem concentrating on a video game for a long period for long periods. Given the fast pace of many games, some have wondered if video games might aggravate attention problems. Some studies have linked greater time spent with video games as well as television to increased risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder symptoms. Um, these, there's also evidence that pathological gaming, defined as persistent trouble uh, controlling game uh, play habits despite bad consequences, is more common among young children, young people who show signs of ADHD. One study found that teens with attention problems were more likely to go on to develop unhealthy gaming habits. So for ADHD kids, it becomes a focus and they can't do anything else. Look at her toes. Look at that. She's got a bunion on the side of her toe. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> Children with ADHD tend to have problems with executive functions, such as working memory and response inhibition, that allow children to focus on what the teacher is saying, wait for their turn to talk, and keep track of assignments. A study comparing children with and without ADHD found that the first group did worse on a standard computer-based test of attention and inhibition involving clicking on a series of alphabet letters. However, both groups did equally well on PlayStation iToy games that tapped similar skills. This supports other research suggesting that children with ADHD do better with novel stimulating tasks that offer immediate rewards, as many video games do. Immediate rewards. Wait a minute. Didn't we just... I learned something from Walter Mitchell. That's Walter Mitchell, by the way. Yes.
Yes, we did. And I get this is PlayStation I I I toy, where you, I guess you race. You can race by how how hard you pump your legs, I guess, and that throws you ahead, and it puts your face on these characters. I guess that's what I toy was. Researchers compared a standard computer-based working memory training program for children with ADHD to a program that added game elements, including a story, animation, and rewards. Children who trained with the game version stuck with training longer, improved faster, and made fewer mistakes. Other studies, which assigned children and adults to PlayStation video games, found that gameplay improved sustained attention and reduced impulsivity. Despite these promising findings, researchers caution that it's too soon to add video games to ADHD treatment plans. Results of studies on normal populations may not translate to people with attention problems whose brains work a bit differently. Compared to attention problems, uh, there are fewer studies looking at whether video games might dis uh, contribute to depression. In a large study of urban fifth graders, heavy play of violent video games, two hours plus per day, was associated with a higher number of depressive symptoms. In a study of Norwegian teens, scoring high on a, on a measure of video game addiction was linked to depression, but time spent on games was not. Similarly, young teens who self-report symptoms of depression don't spend more time playing video games or violent games compared to their peers, but they are more likely to play to cope with feelings and forget problems. A recent study of nearly 5,000 young British teens found that those who kept video game play in, a bal in balance with other activities with less than one-third of daily free time devoted to gaming, scored higher on emotional and social well-being compared to non-gamers. However, children who spent more than half of their daily free time with video games had more emotional and behavioral problems, as well as lower life satisfaction. Recent evidence suggests that more than half of Americans play games and have at least one gaming console in their homes. Really? Among children, the numbers are even higher, with almost all boys playing video games and a smaller majority of girls playing as well. One of the things, I, my, my grandson plays uh, soccer at a fairly high level, and one of the things I noticed, uh, I watched him play his Fortnite game, and um, <laughs> whenever they play a team that isn't very good, uh, I always see them running in that Fortnite way, the, the with their arms back, as if they have a I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, it, it's really kind of kind of interesting because uh, since I've watched him play his games, he's got these little dances that he does uh, in Fortnite. And when I see those dances being performed on the field, it's usually by the less skilled players, as if you know the Fortnite, as if they have a secret and they're they're giving out this Fortnite uh, dancing tip or something, or running like a Fortnite Superman. It's Superman that puts his arms back in, in Fortnite. I, I don't know. Anyway, it's just a, it's just a personal observation of a very small sample of people. Among children, the numbers are even higher, with almost all boys playing video games and a smaller majority of girls playing as well. Women are almost as likely to play video games as men, and adults are as likely to play as children and adolescents. A third of American parents play video games with their children at least once a week, and just over half believe that games are a positive part of their children's lives. Games and gamers are ubiquitous. People play alone and together at home and on the move. All this time spent gaming has largely been at the expense of time previously spent consuming other kinds of media, in particular TV and movies. Nonetheless, people have often worried that gaming has caused serious problems for social interaction and physical activity and health. However, data from gamers themselves question whether such stereotypes apply to the majority of gamers. The social isolated, physically inactive, teenage gamer certainly exists, 
but she or he is an endangered species. That's according to a book written by people who are promoting gameplay. There's lots of evidence that the, the young of many species play with each other and spend a lot of time engaging in generally fairly rough and tumble activities, which seem to serve no obvious purpose. No obvious purpose, perhaps, until we start asking questions about what is being learned during all this play. Barbara Fredrickson argues that when we play, we are actually experimenting with new ways of solving problems in a safe environment which permits creative experimentation and does not penalize failure. Experimenting with new ways of escaping from a real predator is not a sensible thing to do. In contrast, experimenting with different ways of running away, dodging and hiding with your brothers and sisters might broaden the range of options you have and build physical and psychological resources that could help you survive when the predator is a real one. Fredrickson's broaden and build uh, theory suggests that play lies at the heart of learning and those individuals who play stand a greater chance of survival than those who don't precisely because they have uh, greater flexibility in the behavioral responses available to them. Even seemingly pointless activities such as tickling may actually serve an important function. Donald Black observed that the places where we are most ticklish, the neck, the sides of the body, the exposed soles of the feet, are also those which we might need to protect in an emergency. Tickling motivates us to escape while simultaneously making us laugh. It simulates an emergency situation in that we need to protect vital areas of our bodies from being attacked by an opponent who is not going to give up. Play and fun are inextricably tied up with survival. Like soldiers on the firing range, young organisms engage in safe but violent facsimiles of real-world fight or flight, life or death situations. So long as everyone knows that it is a game, with punches stopping short and teeth nibbling rather than biting, everyone benefits from the activity. Games can also be understood as meeting basic psychological needs. Video games can help us to meet basic psychological needs that are not always met through real-life activities, particular uh, needs for socialization, competence, and autonomy. One can inhabit the fictional universe of a video game in which, along with friends, one can seem to have a real and meaningful impact on the game, uh, game world through one's own actions. This can be powerfully motivating. Conrad Lorenz reminds us that aggression is a drive, a naturally occurring behavior which helps organisms get what they need. While aggressive behavior may not be appropriate in many situations which face modern humans, and aggressive behavior certainly is not an important issue facing society, we should not fall into the trap of believing aggressive responses are never appropriate. Aggression motivates us to require uh, what we need, achieve our goals, and help defend what we have from others who aggress against us. An individual who lacked aggressive behaviors on which to draw on in times of need would not pass its genes on to the next generation. There is a natural component to aggression, and aggressive behavior is not necessarily a negative thing, although it may be if overused or used maladaptively. What are the effects of repeated experiences of aggression or repeated exposure to the aggression of others? There are two main responses to this question. Theories which focus on the desensitizing effects of violence and exposure to violence state that repeated exposure to violence reduces its emotional impact and makes violent acts normal. If we live in an environment where, rightly or wrongly, we perceive violence to be normal, then there is nothing wrong with behaving violently ourselves. In this account, exposure to violent video games desensitizes people to violence, making them more likely to be violent in the future. Theories which emphasize catharsis of new aggression and violence in much the same way as Lorenz, as drives which need to be discharged. 
The principle of catharsis is seen as a form of purging or purifying innate emotions and tensions, leaving us in a state of balance. Under these ideas, VV, uh, violent video game play represents a psychological, psychologically healthy activity, and indeed we might predict that it would lead to a reduction rather than an increase in real-life violence. And of course, you got to remember, these are, the, these are guys writing this uh, to support the violent video game uh, industry. Different researchers choose different measures of aggression, and these relate with differing degrees of effectiveness to the sorts of real-life behavior we are interested in. Sometimes the measure of aggression is not chosen by the researcher at all, but is simply already available. If we believed uh, there to be a link between violent video game uh, playing and violence, we might conclude that as the availability of violent video, game, uh, video games increase, the amount of violent crime also increases. Our, or our hypothesis might lead us to predict a strong association between the two. As violent video game um, availability increases, so does violent crime. Patrick and Charlotte Marquet uh, in 19, uh, 2010 argued that no one personality dimensions makes a person vulnerable, but that certain levels in three of the big five dimensions openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, when present in the same individual, might be critical. Their conclusion is that people who score low on conscientiousness, low on agreeableness, and high on neuroticism may possess a pre-existing disposition to be negatively affected by violent video games. Such people tend to be fairly unconcerned about the feelings of others, are likely to break rules and not worry about convention, and experience strong emotional reactions to events. When exposed to violence or frustration, people who have this vulnerable personality may respond strongly and without concern for social rules or the feelings of others. There is a gene, uh, that's, that's one of the theories. Oops, I'm sorry. Sorry, I went the wrong direction. Okay, we've got three more slides. <laughs> this is one of the theories. This is another one. There are There is a gene that affects the levels of, of an enzyme, monoamine oxidase A, which is responsible for the breaking down some of the chemicals affecting transmission of information to, in the brain. About a third of the population has a version of the MAOA gene, which means they produce lower levels of the enzyme. Such people are indistinguishable from those who produce normal levels of the enzyme, except when certain environmental conditions hold. Research examined the effects of MAOA uh, levels and childhood maltreatment or violent criminal behavior. Neither MAOA level nor a history of childhood maltreatment had an effect in isolation, but in combination, the two accounted for a significant proportion of violent crime. There is a fairly clear and increasing evidence that violent video games do not cause aggression, but may interact with the biological and psychological characteristics of individual people, making some more vulnerable individuals more likely to respond aggressively than before. And this is what I've been saying all along. It, all, it has to do with a lot of different things, and we can't just separate one, one small thing uh, the environment, uh, your biological uh, proclivity for violence, um, the video games themselves. You can't just take one aspect and say this is what causes people to, to, uh, uh, to shoot up a school. And that is the end of this lecture. So next week we will tackle, we'll tackle this some more. Okay.